Hello and welcome to uh, this new episode episode of Beyond Conversations. My name is David Orban and I am the managing advisor of uh, Beyond Enterprises. And I am very excited to um, welcome our guest, uh, Philip uh, Rosedale, who may you may know as uh, the founder of uh, Linden Lab, the um, makers of uh, Second Life. It, but uh, Philip uh, has a lot of different, uh, very interesting projects uh, uh, around virtual worlds, uh, digital creation of communities and sharing and um, participating in our uh, virtual and physical worlds constructively. Um, I welcome your questions um, already on the various uh, platforms. Uh, you have supplied a few that uh, you would like me to ask, uh, Philip. But um, if you have any uh, others, uh, I will be happy to take them on while uh, we are live as well. So without further ado, welcome, Philip Rosedale. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So um, over the, 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 the years, we had uh, several conversations. Um, they may have been at conferences or some other time where we joined in, in online panels or in, in one of the one conversations like this. In, and as I was thinking uh, what, what to ask you, I realized that in a lot of ways, uh, what you do as it is then implemented in the various platforms that you create is about online collaboration of communities and how these communities can be supported by tools that allow the governance and, and the, the, uh, the coordination of, of digital collaboration and creation. Is it a correct uh, intuition and, and the kind of a feel rouge uh, in, in your entrepreneurial activity? Well, I think that I always had an interest from the very beginning, from the you know, for me, most importantly, from the beginning of the internet, you know, around 1994, the consumer internet, I always had an interest, yes, in how people connect and communicate and work together and, you know, can, how or whether people can do those things entirely online, you know, uh, but yeah, I think that I, and, and I think this has changed and grown over the years, but I've always had a particular interest in whether online environments can truly be real and, and in particular can create uh, the ability for people to communicate, establish trust, collaborate, share, work together uh, in, a, in a genuine, you know, deep human way online. And I think we're, you know, we're part way where, you know, I guess we're 30 years into that experiment and there's a lot more work to do. And, you know, it's an exciting space to be in, but sometimes a hard space. I collaborated with uh, General Lanier at VPL Research, uh, so let's make it 40. <laughs> but right. uh, for sure, uh, uh, the, the, the journey has been very interesting, but uh, there's still a lot uh, to be done. Now, as we talk about tools that uh, enable this type of collaboration, um, is the current insistence on immersivity in your opinion, crucial or a bit superficial and may even become an obstacle in discovering the more essential components of collaboration? Right. I, I think that immersion, uh, say by you know wearing a VR headset or something like that for the purpose of exploring static information, like flying around inside the you know, the engine of a, a jet or something as a way of better understanding how to build the next one is a viable way to use technology, you know, uh, to, to immerse yourself. I think the problem with immersion is that it doesn't get us very much closer to feeling like we're really in the same room with each other in all the richest senses of that, you know, the we build trust with other people primarily through face-to-face -face interaction with them. And we haven't yet 
even with VR headsets, we haven't enabled that. So I think what's happening with VR headsets is we're telling ourselves that we want to do something. And the something is when you and I have our headsets on and we're in this space together, we're really going to be able to establish and build a relationship the same way we could if we were in the same room together. I think that idea aspirationally is a wonderful goal, but like you say, distraction right now, it's so not working that it is actually in many ways taking us a step back. You know, VR headsets are damaging, particularly with respect to inclusivity. Um, not everybody is comfortable wearing them. No, actually, nobody is comfortable wearing them for a long time. And some people are a lot less comfortable wearing them than each other. And what that means is that, unfortunately, in a way that is not, for example, what the early internet was like, um, there is a very homogenous group of people that are the only ones willing to wear these strange devices. And so we're just not getting anywhere yet, you know, to creating virtual worlds like Second Life, for example, which is a big open, everybody's in there, every age, every gender, every behavior is well represented in there. Uh, we're not even, we don't even know how to solve the science problems with getting to that with headsets on. And, and uh, another factor is, of course, uh, the, the unit costs, uh, uh, yeah. even uh, the, the, the $400 of a uh, uh, of a Meta Quest, let alone the three thousand dollars of uh, the Apple uh, headset, it represent right. a barrier to entry that uh, that uh, is um, creates creates exclusivity rather than than inclusivity. Uh, at the time of Second Life, uh, I was um, happy to see some experiments uh, uh, that would in. Uh, alternative browsers uh, make it more immersive, but I didn't feel that the 2D representation uh, uh, subtracted too much uh, from the experience. Right, and 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 we know that from from uh, video games uh, how compelling they they can be. Uh, let me ask you something about Second Life, and you can tell me whether at the time you felt that this would that this was kind of a watershed when when i tell people oh by the way uh mal burns uh says hello to both you and me and uh, he's a, a second life uh, friend so uh, i i he don't sure know if is. i, I have know. ever met uh, him irl but uh, <laughs> for sure i i remember him from from second life so um when, when I tell people about Second Life, uh, I tell them uh, the United States uh, Secret Service killed Second Life, uh, which, of course, is not true for many reasons. It's, it just sounds very dramatic, uh, first of all, because Second Life is alive and well. Uh, second, because uh, what, uh, what they did uh, was you know, uh, legitimate from, from their point of view, so it wasn't... Um, uh, any any kind of assassination, but what happened, as as far as I know, is that the radical economic experiment that uh, Second Life represented, especially when when banks from I don't remember if Norway or Denmark started opening branches and people would be able to open accounts, they said no, sorry, this is this is not something uh, we can allow to do. Uh, and and the shift in what was allowed and not allowed in Second Life, for me, meant that a little bit of the soul of the platform left, uh, and and what remained was still compelling, but less exciting uh, as uh, than than before. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a broader philosophical story there about freedom and our desperate desire for individual freedom, which we you know may or may not ever really be able to get, but. Uh, and sometimes want, I think sometimes, particularly on the internet, we want freedom beyond a point of rational utility. You know, like we, 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 we want, for example, with things like crypto to 
uh, or we, we, we would believe that by establishing, for example, you know, perfect individual sort of freedom and control over uh, behavior that we'll get to a world that we would want to live in together with other people. And I think it's much more complicated than that. The answer is, well, you know, in a society, there are, there are, uh, in, in any community, there are consequences for your actions. And that is part of the majestic human experience that there are consequences for your actions, right? And so to dream of a world in which there are no consequences for your actions is to dream of a pretty unpleasant world. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we think about that. But I, 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 would, I guess, you know, you're talking about Second Life losing some of its luster. I think what you're saying is just in the sense that as a company, there were some things that we had to uh, not let people do, for example, like uh, some kinds of gambling and, uh, uh, you know, uh, unleashing Ponzi schemes on each other. You know, a, a funny aside, right, is that Second Life has its own currency, as you mentioned, and it still today has a, uh, you know, better part of a billion dollar a year uh, in GDP and transactions between people in the virtual world. Um, but there were times that people did things like set up bank, set up banks in Second Life that offered rates of return on the interest that could never possibly be, you know, offered by any rational policy other than a Ponzi scheme where, you know, the earliest people get some money and then everybody else gets screwed. And that's an example of something that we, 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 uh, because we were a centralized company, we were actually able to stop people from doing that, which is kind of interesting, right? The crypto and DeFi, what we've seen is we can't stop people from doing that. And isn't that wonderful? But is it actually wonderful? What we've seen is mostly that people have taken advantage of the anonymous, uh, irreversible nature of crypto to screw each other and take money from each other to a point so much that the average person doesn't want to join in and use crypto. I'd say there's multiple reasons for that, but one is certainly that um, they're almost certainly going to get scammed and have money stolen from them, you know, and so wisely they choose not to engage. So I, I think there's a trade-off between um, the way that a company, I guess, which is probably a bad answer, but a community uh, co-regulates its behavior, you know, amongst itself, that is very important to get right. And I think that's one of the things that we haven't uh, very often seen done right. Although I would say that Second Life is pretty close, did a pretty good job. Um, high fidelity was an attempt in making a platform more scalable, uh, integrating blockchain, uh, distributed servers that would replicate uh, the uh, digital world and um, I was very excited in, in following it then it abandoned the immersive part it pivoted to be a shared uh, um, space with spatial uh, audio, audio. Mm -hmm. and uh, that went on for a bit and and then kind of nothing so what what happened? Uh, what was the roadblock yeah. uh, in delivering on its original mission of decentralized blockchain-based open source distributed immersive virtual yeah. world? Well, we started the company in 2013 just as the Oculus Kickstarter came out. So I actually got the chip that is the gyro chip if you're really into the electronics of VR headsets, it was the gyro chip, the, 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 the gyroscope on a chip that was actually the key driver that made it possible for Oculus to do a Kickstarter and kind of start the whole restart, as you said, and go back to Jaron and VPL, but the Oculus kind of restarted the whole industry around that one chip. And I got that chip in our office. And as soon as I played with the chip, I realized like everybody else that it was going to be possible to build a VR headset. And so the big risk that I took, the entrepreneurial risk was to raise a bunch of money and start hiring people with the idea that we would build a new open, as you said, uh, open source distributed virtual world that was designed entirely to be used with those headsets. And what happened was fast forward from 
six years later to 2019. By 2019, we had had thousands and thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, put headsets on in high fidelity for a variety of different reasons. Parties, exploring museums, teaching kids, all kinds of different things. With, with the majority of the use being in the Oculus Rift or, you know, later the Oculus Quest, but, you know, predominantly the Oculus Rift headset. What we realized in 2019 was that it wasn't going to work. What we realized was that most people didn't want to put a headset on. They certainly didn't want to put one on for longer than, say, 30 minutes. And the types of experiences we were trying to create, working together, going to a live music event, you know, playing together, meeting new people, debating something, you know, all of those experiences, first of all, required that people have the headset on for more than like 30 minutes because, you know, they're listening to a speaker or they're trying to make a new friend or they're trying to do something really involved, right? So what we realized was nobody was comfortable wearing these devices for a long time. And then, as I said earlier, we realized that the even more unfortunate thing was that the, the types of people who are comfortable basically being blindfolded in public, which is how I often describe wearing a VR headset, unfortunately skewed the distribution of people that were going to come into these worlds. And so the people that were less comfortable felt more at risk, felt like they were more of a you know, minority at any moment, you know, when they were, you know, using the devices, were even less likely to use those devices. And so we realized that aside from the cost, which you mentioned earlier, we realized that these things were going to be terribly divisive and homogenizing in terms of the people willing to use them. And so we made the very hard decision to more or less wind down the majority of our operations, you know, and we were we were over a hundred people at that point and had raised a lot of money to work on it. So we got, and, and we, we just ran into this wall where we realized we are not going to be able to get all genders, for example, equally interested in using these devices. And if we don't have that, we don't have a social experience. And so, and, and I think in the, by the way, in the three years or four years since then, we've corroborated what our guess was, which was VR headsets are not going to be widely adopted. And even with COVID, which was obviously such an incredible impetus to go home and, you know, kit out your home office and get more gear, even with that, we did not see significant growth in the, in the widespread use of VR devices, except in some very narrow cases. Um is that your prediction about the Apple device too then? Um, now, evidently, the first generation is more oriented towards developers, including because of the price tag. Right. Uh, it introduces some interesting uh, uh, things like the, the, the see-through simulation where yeah. you are seen as you see outside, which eliminates a little bit of that feeling yeah. of being blindfolded, as you said. Uh, but uh, do you think it is still going to be something that is not, well, or that at least needs another three, four generations to become more mature? You have to wonder, every time Apple has given us a, a wonderful new product, which they've done a number of times, right? It has been, they have shown us a completely new way to use computers, technology to experience the world or ourselves, you know, in a completely new way. I think the thing with the iPhone, for example, that was incredible was the availability to get on the internet and use the internet in the way that most people want to use it, but from a tiny little phone. And they were the first, it was the first moment where we could finally use a thing in our pocket to get on the internet and it just worked, right? So that was an enormous qualitative breakthrough. The question I ask about the Apple Vision Pro is, what is the breakthrough? And I think the breakthrough, which I didn't see in the demos, would be that I could do computing while talking to my coworkers who are far away. I could use a computer while looking right in my friend's eyes and talking to him about the project that we were working on together. And I noted 
that although they teased at those ideas in the presentation, they didn't substantially demonstrate them. So I think the ability that, that the acid test for the Vision Pro is to put it on two people who don't know each other in different rooms. <laughs> Let them communicate with each other while wearing that thing. And then later, very carefully ask them, are you comfortable with that? Was that a good way to meet that person? Is that working for you? And, and what I think we have with the Vision Pro is we are not even at the point where we can test that, at least from what I saw in the demonstrations and, and beyond. And so we're looking at a device which is not even worth arguing about yet, as Steve Jobs said, because it doesn't yet enable the question of whether this works or not. You know, like, can I hang out with a bunch of people and feel normal while I'm doing computing, you know? I think that's the breakthrough. Looking at the inside of a rocket engine or something, that is a cool thing and we're all excited about it. But frankly, as you mentioned earlier, we've been doing that in industrial settings for 40 years. It is not a breakthrough. Apple is not gonna make anything new with looking at rocket engines or airplane engines. Uh, as uh, an let, let, alone, let alone movies, uh, a, a huge amount of the demo right. was about being on a sofa and yeah. watching movies. Totally yeah, and I, th I, I think the device will be ex exactly as successful as 3D television has been, which is a total fail. Hmm. I don't All want right. a 3D TV. I don't, I yeah. don't think I want to wear a headset to watch a movie, like you said, and not be able to see my kids. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I used to have a 3D TV, and I did watch uh, Avatar, uh, <laughs> uh, and that was it. I, I watched Avatar in the movie in 3D too, and it was amazing and fantastic, especially the the, uh, the floating uh, bubble of uh, uh, blob of water at the beginning, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, one of uh, one of our listeners on uh, Facebook is asking Babele, who, by the way, is uh, also uh, a, a pioneer uh, of uh, VR. Uh, in his own right, um, about about software. Yeah. Now he 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 talks about the web, but uh, let's take it uh, uh, in the stack a few steps down. Um, are we in agreement that uh, TCP/IP is just fine and and it will be able to uh, to support what we need? And and if yes, where is it that we have to start wondering if the software infrastructure supports our vision? I think most of the problems are with conveying nonverbal communication sufficiently well. Um, Zoom, like we're using right now, or you know, streaming video, like we're using to do this discussion, is good. It's not appealing, but it's good enough to see each other's facial expressions and nonverbal cues. So, for example, if I lean forward because I'm really interested in what you're saying, or I lean back because kind of getting bored. I don't really know. I'm looking at the ceiling. Those are things you can see. Unfortunately, you can't see those things in an avatar. Mm -hmm. You can tell yourself you're seeing them. But for example, you know, as we've all, <laughs> I, I really laughed with the whole Facebook, there are no legs on the avatars meme or whatever we want to call that. You know, everybody had so much fun with that. And I think that was really rich because it's both funny but it also speaks to a fundamental problem that we have, which is that if I don't know where your feet and your hips are, I can't read your body language. You know, if your body is sort of dangling underneath your neck, which is what we're, we've sort of done with a lot of these VR systems, I can't understand you. So going back to what you said and going back to the question there, it's not about the web or TCP IP. I think those things are good enough. And I think the web has really grown a lot lately and has gotten a lot of capability, right? I think a lot of stuff can be done straight up on the web. And I, I love the idea of it. And I guess after yesterday with everybody complaining at unity about their pricing, I guess the, <laughs> the web looks all the better, <laughs> but, but the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem is that, communication doesn't feel right between people in these environments. Not, not good enough. Of course it does. It's, it's interesting. And there are many people who are doing many interesting things and making new friends and stuff, but uh, 
the average person that you pull off the street in New York or something, if you put a VR headset on them and you put a VR headset on somebody else they don't know and you let them interact as strangers, they're going to say, I am profoundly uncomfortable with that. I do not feel I understand that person. I don't feel safe. I don't feel a degree of connection with them. So that's the stuff that needs to get fixed. And I think, this is a, you know, to make a long story short, I think the problems are more in the hardware devices than they are in the network and the transport layer or even the compute layer you know i think uh, you mean the sensor are, are necessary in order to capture our yeah. body yeah. in order to be able to represent it in the digital world and and that answers the the question that scott summit uh, is asking scott is a, a leader in uh, 3d printing and and uh, he also is in robotics and uh, prosthetics and all kinds of cool yeah. things. He says, can we expect to see virtual worlds enhanced and augmented by full body physical interaction? And the answer is we must, or, or, or I, I, I would guess uh, your answer is unless yeah. it happens, we are not delivering on our vision. Yeah. I mean, I think there's two stages there and let me break them apart. The first stage is conveying body information. Like, like, you, like he said, conveying body information well enough to another person that without them speaking, I could say, oh, that's my friend. I can tell from how she's moving. And uh, I can see it from the look on her face that she's kind of unhappy. You know, once we get to that, that's the first stage is we have to convey the body well enough to another person that they could look like recognize us without us using our voices. And we are totally not there yet. We, we might be close, but you know, it's just like, you know, what it's like, you know, uh, what is it? Ray tracing and 3D graphics is always, you know, just two years away. So I mean, it's the same problem. The second problem, though, about embodiment, and it's one that I think is philosophically interesting. So I don't know, you know, how much time we want to waste on it. But it's that if I if I can't block you from going somewhere, if I can't hold your hand and kind of inhibit your motion <laughs> as I'm holding your hand because we're shaking hands, we're not shaking hands. That in, until embodiment really involves uh, the fact, in, until it really replicates that two people can't be in the same physical space at the same time, or that if I give you a hug, I'm kind of constraining you for the time that I'm hugging you. I actually think that we're there's there's something very wrong with not being able to get to that. And so I think that there's this secondary problem, and we've done a little work on this in my lab, there's this secondary, very substantial problem of physicality always involving kind of conflict and tension. You know, we we manipulate the world, but we can't both move the we, we we can't both move the same thing at the same time unless one of us is stronger than the other one, right? And we're not getting to that yet in VR. And whether it's literally, you know, using some crazy interface that lets us wrestle with each other in VR, or a different way that we learn to navigate virtual spaces that respects that kind em embraces and respects that kind of tension between us. We're not going to get to philosophically appealing worlds. I think there's a deadness to a world where I'm in control of my space and you're totally not because you're a visitor. There's a deadness to that, that I think we're not going to be able to get past. Um, Malburn says that uh, uh, meta avatars got legs, but they are still not working well. <laughs> and 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 Scott uh, thanks you for your answer and uh, adds that uh, motion capture will be, of course, uh, important. Um, proxemics yeah. is the name of the science that studies um, how body language um, and and uh, the immersion in physical spaces allows interaction that is uh, positive or, or conflictual. A classic example of proxemics is how you can actually enter the lion's den and not to be eaten if you know uh, what is the lion's personal space and, and how to move uh, without provoking an attack. Uh, more in the abstract, uh, and I tend to have a <clears throat> bit more philosophical conversations. So from my point of view, it's not uh, time wasted, but well invested. Uh, I remember how important it was for Second Life to set up rules for the 
handling of digital goods that in some way anticipate and implement where it is already possible what you are talking about for physical bodies or the digital equivalent of the physical bodies in the avatars. So we could and probably still can define that a digital object in second life can be bought, but the buyer cannot transfer it to a third person. Right. Uh, and, and that is just one example of an extremely rich set of capabilities and interactions and constraints that uh, very interestingly, by reducing sometimes what could be done in a world of absolute digital freedom, generated um, consequences that were positive for the entire uh, ecosystem. Right. Uh, so let's uh, stay in the, the world of governance, but uh, jump, make a jump. One of your latest projects, or or I would say containers maybe, uh, is um, a, called a IRL uh, 415. Uh, right. IRL stands usually for in real world or in real life, but uh, in your case, it's uh, in reality lab. Uh, tell us about <laughs> right. it, and uh, and uh, then uh, I will have some questions. What is IRL, and and how are you structuring it? Well, the as you say, the first thing, the IRL piece of it, and the, the four one five as well, was just the idea that um, we well, as we've all come back to work after COVID and and during COVID, as we've explored different ways of working together, we've discovered that you know there's meaningfully two really different ways to work together, right? One of them is in the same room uh, physically and the other one is not. And, you know, before COVID, uh, there were a lot of people who held out that we couldn't work in when we weren't in the same room, right? And of course, that's the big comical sometimes conversation that the world is having with itself right now is reckoning with the fact that we proved during COVID that there was lots of kinds of work that we could do remotely from each other, which is awesome. However, there are also things that are uniquely uh, aspects and, you know, benefits and you know, sometimes cons of, of actually being in the same room together. So we kind of, uh, in building this lab, and IRL 415 is a community technology lab. As you said, it's not even incorporated at present. It's a bunch of people trying to figure out how to work together on projects. So it's a lab that you can fill out our form and it, you know if you're in san francisco ask us to come by and visit and we're, what we're trying to do is build a community of people that are building technology working together in a single physical space or when they choose to come by are are and uh, we've got a bunch of projects underway we've got a uh, we're looking at projects like fellowship programs one of which is on the site today um, and we are generally what we're doing is we're trying to, I guess at the level of the projects, we're trying to work on hard technology projects where working together helps, where, you know, playing around with say hardware and software in a space together is a leveraged thing to do. We're also trying to look with a particular eye toward whether the use of these technologies is a benefit to humans, you know, whether we're helping human thriving and whether we're doing things in a humane and and sensible way um, for the needs of people, which of course has become such a big, important conversation in tech you know, over the last decade. Um, so, so we're trying to recruit people to a very different type of a community where there is a tremendous amount of collaboration and assistance and uh, risk, collective risk reduction going on. And as you said, we're I love to play around with social designs and in both in the real world and in the virtual world. And so we're kind of in the early stages of doing that. And yeah, if you're in San Francisco and you want to, and you've got, you know, you know, skills and interests and in working on technology projects, uh, hit us up and come by. That that's, uh, that's very interesting. And, uh, of course, uh, San Francisco is, a uh, 
fantastically rich environment for this kind of experimentation in terms of people uh, both having uh, the curiosity, the openness, the skills, but also to some degree being able to afford to 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 do these to do these experiments uh, from a social point of view, from an economic point of view. So so this is uh, uh, really uh, really cool. Uh, now you mentioned something uh, about uh, tech needing to grow up and be more self-aware and more introspective in understanding if the direction it is taking is beneficial to the community that is impacting to humanity at large. Um, and yes, that has been um, ever more present in conversations. Do you feel that uh, it is now sufficiently in the forefront of those that have the resources to radically advance technology like Meta who are convinced that releasing ever larger and more powerful large language models is prudent or uh, OpenAI who is begging for regulation and others are wondering, is that just going to increase the cost of competition and, and, and keep um, new ideas and new startups out from being able to prove themselves and deliver benefits potentially at a greater degree than open AI? Yeah. Um, so, so are we there yet? And if we are not, what is needed in order to make sure that uh, we are not trusting our luck blindly as we play with ever more powerful technologies. I think that's well put. Trusting our luck blindly as we play with ever more powerful tech. You asked a specific question there, I, I, you know, which I think, you know, begging an opinion on, say, open AI being closed versus, uh, you know, Facebook being open with respect to the development of large language models. I think that's a tough one. You know, if we had Jaron Lanier here, for example, who's a brilliant thinker on this stuff, he'd, he'd have lots to say. I, I would say that it's complicated. That, that is to say, there's no there's no categorically correct answer there. Um, in, I, it, you know, if you slam things all the way to the extreme of there is one great oracle run by OpenAI who will bestow upon us all her great wisdom um, if Sam Altman wants us wants her to or whatever. Um, I think that's a very bad outcome, you know, an overly centralized, dangerous outcome. Um, similarly, I think if we um, don't do any regulation, open source everything and encourage people to create as much uh, harm or self-interested progress as they possibly can, you know, by using the open source code, I, that's probably not a very good outcome either. That said, if you push me on the question of open source, I would go toward the open source side. Um, one of my friends and advisors is Stephen Wolfram, who's the brilliant you know, scientist behind Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha. Um, he and I have talked about this a lot. And the gist of some of those conversations has been, you got to hope that the world gets to have a lot of different AIs in it and not a few. And I think that general statement is, is sound. And so I think that we're safer off in this early moment in the dark with AI. It's safer to have there be at least numerous uh, companies and teams and people working on similarly powerful things. And we have to hope that that happens and that we don't get a exponential of some kind that favors you know, the creation of one ever larger and larger model. I think that's a more risky existential position for us to be in. Um, the way I put it is that uh, centralized uh, organizations uh, and solutions can be more efficient and can bring us very efficiently in the mortally wrong direction. Yeah, right. Uh, before China was able to experiment with uh, the um, economic zones of Shanghai and Shenzhen and uplift hundreds of millions of people from abject poverty, 
the previous experiment was uh, the cultural revolution that killed 40 million. Right. Uh, so uh, we, we don't want uh, that to happen. Uh, and decentralization, as it is very evident uh, in our representative democracies, uh, is uh, inefficient, um, uh, very uh, confusing and chaotic and uh, uh, certainly not uh, perfect. Uh, but uh, allows, especially in uh, federal uh, nations, many different ways of living to be experimented with, at least to a certain degree. So right. probably a good objective is to make sure that whatever we do, uh, the degrees of freedom for human flourishing increase rather than decrease. And it is a good measure of... Uh, uh, succeeding in building inclusive uh, communities. Uh, we, we have a question from Lucho. Uh, is IRL working on blockchain or other solutions for humanitarian purposes that you can talk about already? So I don't know if um, it is specifically humanitarian, but maybe uh, you can talk about uh, uh, fair share, uh, which is uh, a blockchain based uh, platform that uh, allows people to use it for many different applications, including humanitarian applications. Yeah. And let me also say hello and smile at and uh, uh, credit uh, Lucio, who is a friend and has given some great advice about fair share, in fact, um, which is one of the projects at IRL that probably bears some discussion here because it is blockchain like it is not it is not blockchain tech um, uh, at all, but it is uh, it is related to money. And it's one of the things that I am incredibly passionate about. And the site is fairshare.social, as you're showing right now. And uh, yeah, ex exploring the simulation, I kind of <laughs> stop there. The, uh, the idea with Fairshare, which is one of our projects, and in general, as, as we touched on, our, the idea of our projects is to, you know, use technology in ways that can work against, you know, maybe some of the harm that we've done in the last decade or so. Th this relates to how money works. And this simulation that you're looking at is a simulation that most people, especially tech entrepreneurs, especially, you know, Americans, would jump to a conclusion about what happens in this simulation, which is dead wrong. The simulation is a simulation where a bunch of people shown here as little red, blue and green dots are running around in an open market, bumping into each other. And every time they bump into each other, they buy or sell something from each other. They 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 do a free market transaction. They, they, they buy something from one of them buys something from the other one. And who buys from whom is a 50 50 coin toss. And uh, what that means is that this is a kind of a simulation of a perfect free market in which um, everybody is just equal and they're just buying and selling stuff from each other. And the kind of red pill moment about money is that many people, including almost all crypto maximalist type people, would say, if you run a simulation where a bunch of identical people buy and sell stuff from each other in a free market, the amount of money that every person has will stay about the same. That is to say, if you start them all off with one Bitcoin <laughs> and you let them just start trading things with each other, using Bitcoins as money, for example, and buying and selling stuff from each other, you'd figure that if you came back a year later, the wealth distribution the inequality would be very, very low because, of course, these are identical people and they're just buying, you know, cigarettes from each other or whatever when they run into each other. What you see when you run this simulation, which I did in 2020 and was kind of the red pill, un, un, unseeable moment, you know, for me. And, and you can actually see that here, by the way, by if you, that little switch in the upper corner there, <laughs> the little green switch. Go click on that so it turns red. Turning that switch off takes us back to reality as we know it today in free markets. Watch that little needle down at the bottom. By the way, GPT helped us put that speedometer and needle into the simulation in one shot, which is just, as a side note, 
unbelievably impressive that how, how well GPT can program. But the, the needle there you can see is slowly beginning to climb. That needle is inequality. When it gets up into the red area on the right there, that's when you're talking about people having revolutions, getting the pitchforks out, finding the rich people, taking the money back, you know, overthrowing the king. What you can see there is that if a free market is allowed to run on its own with nothing else happening, it's not free or fair at all. What happens is a few randomly chosen people become a little bit more wealthy than the others. And then just like in a poker game, they end up eventually getting all the money. And that's what you're seeing happen right here as that needle climbs with the simulation turned off. And it's eventually going to get to 100. And there's eventually literally going to be one green dot the size of the whole screen, which is our sort of Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, so to speak, who has been and, the, who's the last person and, standing. And, and a lot of dots. And, yeah, there's even deaths. My, and, and, my son, and we will see yeah. a lot of. Yeah, yeah. My, right. my, my son had the rather morose but correct idea of adding to the model the deaths to indicate those people who are so poor that they have um, killed themselves. In fact, he looked only at that statistic, which is especially morose. Um, 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 suicide has not come of poverty. So the idea there with fair share is was first to simulate the reality. You know, sh I can only show you the truth, like Morpheus said, which is that free market trading concentrates and amplifies inequality literally until there's only one winner. And by the way, that's what we're seeing with crypto. Crypto is a free market, a perfect frictionless free market in which an initial amount of currency is distributed to, in this case, a small number of people. And then they are allowed to just trade with each other however they want. In a sense, that's what crypto is. It's the experiment I just showed you. But guess what the outcome is? The outcome is the number of rich people becomes even smaller and smaller and they become richer and richer. And that happens with crypto even faster than it does with the government. People think that the reason wealth becomes unequally distributed is because there are crooks running the banks that are not giving out loans equally or charging too much interest. It's not true. Although banks exacerbate that problem, the basic economic system of free trade actually causes that problem profoundly as it runs. Now, this problem is fixable without making society, taking money away altogether, or making us into perfect communists or something like that. The problem is actually fixable, and this is what fair share does, by enabling a free market, but then also having a continuous mechanism that redistributes money as people are using it back to everybody else. So you have a kind of a, you have a, kind of a capitalist force that concentrates wealth, and then you have a redistributing function that actually kind of you know, takes a little bit of money and gives it back to everybody all the time. And of course, there's many different ways to do this. But guess what? When governments, centrally managed governments, behave well, which does sometimes happen, at least for a short period of time, they actually do just what I just said. And that's how those countries remain fair and places that people would want to live. What those countries do is they have some kind of a tax that collects money more from richer people than from poorer people and gives it back equally to everybody else. It doesn't really matter what the structure or details of that are. All you need is a tax that takes money more from richer people than poorer people and then gives it back equally to everybody. And so that mechanism is what we've built into fair share. And so fair share is an experimental system. It's in a discord prototype right now. I'm looking for people to help me build the app and join, you know, the, the emerging company around this and, and work on it. So if you're interested in it, please reach out to me um, or reach out on, yeah, fairshare.social as well. Um, you can join our Discord group and talk to us in there. But the, the idea here is to build a new kind of money that has that property built into it. No matter how you use it, as you use it, it continuously redistributes money back to everybody. So it provides two things. It stops wealth inequality from growing. It provides a gentle, a gentler way, say, than violent revolution to start redistributing wealth slowly uh, back to everybody. And it also provides basically, because it has a dividend built into it, it provides what we most frequently call today a basic income. But it does it in a way that is safe, private, 
um, local to a community. It's not a single coin for the whole world, which don't get me started, makes no sense at all. Um, it's a very different idea. So that's one of the projects out of IRL that we've been working on. And thank you, Lucio, for bringing that up. And um, so there are a bunch of uh, Discord commands that uh, uh, already people can can use uh, in order to right. interact with the, with the simulation. Um, it, Um, the, 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 the crypto uh, maximalists uh, look at Austrian economics uh, as their inspiration. Do you have a name uh, uh, like Scandinavian socialism, or <laughs> how how would you how would you label uh, the way that this works? You know, I would answer that not by trying to kind of create, as you said, create a new uh, some old guy's name to give to this, although I'm sure there's some old guys' names that apply pretty well to the idea of uh, continuous redistribution of wealth in an economy as a systemic property of the economy. I mean, that's, a, that's a, a, again, you know, most every currency that's existed in history, like, like, you know, fiat currencies, as crypto people say, they all have some degree of redistribution built into them because frankly, duh, it's only the new kids that are working on crypto that could possibly harbor the ridiculous idea that, like I said, giving out all the money to a hundred lucky people and then expecting them to kind of trickle it down to everybody else. That doesn't make any sense. It's never made any sense in history. You know, where the pendulum is finally swinging back against the sort of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher trickle down economics era that's done tremendous harm to society. You know, the Gini index in the United States, for example, for wealth has gone from about 0.6 in the 1950s to about 0.9 today. Um, we are completely screwed as a country if we don't reverse that level of wealth inequality and crypto is only going to make it worse. I think the words, though, for how money should work, rather than, you know, giving you the name of a different school of thought, I would suggest for, for those who want a really great book to read, uh, it's long and it's big, but if you love this stuff and you're philosophically interested in money, you really have got to read this book by Jeff uh, Graber called Debt, The First 5,000 Years. And it's almost a funny name. I love it. It's He's, he's almost just having fun there. But um, this is a, a brilliant writer um, who took on the story of money as an anthropologist more so than as an economist. And so he goes back and he explains how money really works. And what's interesting and the reason why the book is called Debt is that, and, and by the way, I was speaking just the other day to another great writer named Brett Scott, who has written a book called Cloud Money and uh, has most recently, recently written you know, numerous essays on money. Um, one of them is called Zero is the Future of Money. The zero is the future of money and the word debt in the title of this book both tie to the same thing, which is the idea that money historically almost always whenever we've created money as, as the human species, we base it on debt, which means that you don't print a bunch of gold coins and then fight over them. You actually just write an IOU to somebody and they can transfer the IOU to somebody else and you suddenly have money. So there's, you know, one way of making money is to print gold coins and put Caesar's head on them. The other way of making money is I give you some business advice and you, David, write me an IOU that says, I owe Philip $200 for the business advice he gave me. You are now in debt. I have a piece of paper from you that's worth $200 that I can spend on groceries. What that means, if you think about it, is that the money supply that people talk about in monetary theory in a debt-based economy is always zero, which is totally fascinating. The money is essentially printed by the labor by the work, by the, the value creation of individuals. It's a long road that we don't have time for now to go from the idea of mutual credit, which is what Graeber is describing anthropologically as the real history of money, the real way we use money helpfully as people. If you go from that presumption of issuing mutual letters of credit, and then you try to build something that looks like code <laughs> that could actually be used by a bunch of people, 
I will say that that is what fair share is. So fair share is basically saying, huh, what if Graeber's right and we don't want crypto and we don't want fiat and crypto and fiat are basically both the same thing. They're, they're a scarce, weird commodity that you have to go fight over and get, you know, you have to buy it from the government or you have to buy it from the tech bros, right? Um, uh, e either way, you're screwed. And, and instead, we just used mutual credit as a way of how a community exchanges value with itself. If you try to write the code around that, I am I, I propose you get to something like fair share. There may be multiple things like fair share. Maybe there's something even more clever than what we've done with fair share that comes out. But one way or another, a system of money, in my opinion, is going to show up soon that is technology enabled and replicates what we did 5,000 years ago, not what we started doing more like 2,000 years ago with Roman coins. So I am a huge aspirational believer in the same thing that I think a lot of the crypto people like the idea of, which is let's go back to making money work for us and not work for the government. But the way crypto did it was dead wrong. If anything, it was almost a, a pathological failure example of how not to do it. So I'm really enthusiastic about that, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Uh, we are almost uh, out of time, but I would like to ask uh, one last question coming from Giuseppe, uh, who uh, is uh, highlighting a very important point uh, of um, a, a challenge that Web3 is attempting to answer in, to some degree in terms of our digital identities and ownership of yeah. digital identities and digital objects and the legal recognition IRL in the physical yeah. world of the desires of building um, sustainable future in, in the digital world. Uh, how do you feel uh, uh, about that? Um, are, we, are we finding solutions that uh, are, are better than not... Uh, storing our passports on our iPhones for passing the, uh, um, yeah. the, 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 the control gates, uh, stopping our free movement? There's so much to unpack there, and it's such a great question. I think, as you said, both identity and ownership are two different and equally important um, aspects of how we interact with each other in virtual worlds. You know, as Giuseppe says, yeah, we're, you know, we're not there yet. Um, the, 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 the treatment of identity and ownership as yet is still to replicate online the same structures that we use in the real world um you, you know to enforce identity and ownership and i think those structures are not well suited to virtual worlds you know like obviously something like second life is a great example of you know if somebody from you know france and somebody from greece gets in and uh legal dispute about um, intellectual property rights related to their avatar, who, whose law are we supposed to use, right? We don't have a new law yet. So there's this, what is the new law going to be of virtual worlds? And we're still not there yet. And to some extent, it's been because, in my opinion, those virtual worlds haven't been able to get big enough yet to kind of demand a seat at the table. <laughs> we don't yet have virtual worlds with a large enough footprint to be able to push things around in the way, in the way that say, I don't know, Instagram, you know, has a big enough footprint to maybe be a problem or, uh, so I, so I think one problem is that the same sort of stuff we talked about at the beginning of the conversation around nonverbal communication and stuff, it's just not good enough yet to get a billion people wanting to live in a virtual city together and then wanting to build what the legal codes are. I think the crypto decentralized movement is, um, in many ways, uh, equally unsatisfying because, for example, the only trustless mechanisms that you can build for something like ownership are also also pathologically wrong. Um, if you, for example, and, and a very simple example of this is real estate. Um, nobody that's a deep thinker about community building and human society would argue that the right model for real estate is that whoever bought the property first gets to do anything they want with it, including cover it with porn and racist, you know, images and loud music or whatever. And then they can extort their neighbors because they're the sole owner of that piece of virtual property to have to buy it from them, you know, or suffer. 
That, by the way, is something that happened in the early days of Second Life. But because we were a company that did have some degree of ability to write code and enforce community rules, we were able to add like functions that would enable people to collectively agree on what the use of property should be, right? So just as a simple example, you know, the crypto model of ownership being he who holds the title holds everything, right, is deeply wrong for a virtual community where people have to share a common space. And so that's like a simple example as an answer of how stuck we are. As Giuseppe said, I, we're, we are stuck where we've not yet gotten the real world to agree with new legal ideas associated with virtual worlds. And we haven't built the right mechanisms to allow virtual communities to govern themselves in a way that sets the right balance between centralization and decentralization. And both of those limits are not good in the extreme. Philip, uh, we could go on for another two, three hours for sure, <laughs> but I know you have to go. Thank you very much for your time. This has been uh, uh, really uh, great. Congratulations with uh, what you are building with Fair Share and uh, the experiment of IRL 415. I hope to be able to come and visit uh, IRL in IRL. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, thanks again. See you. See you next time. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope uh, I hope it's been helpful and people come and uh, come and visit. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being with us today uh, at uh, this episode of uh, Beyond uh, Conversations. And uh, I will uh, see you next time. Mm -hmm.